hello and welcome to this review of the Space Cadet Keyboard. You didn't think I'd finish off the year without doing one of these, did you? <laughs> the Space Cadet Keyboard is often said to be the holy grail of keyboards as it's excessively rare, very expensive, very well made, insanely complex and it's deeply buried in hacker culture. So there you go, forget the happy hacking keyboard, real hackers use this. This one is on loan to me by one of the admins of Deskthority, which is one of the three main hubs of the Western mechanical keyboard community, and of the three, it's the one most focused on vintage keyboards, so obviously if I was going to find one of these anywhere, it would be there. You'll immediately notice that it doesn't have a case. Originally, these came with a rather plain white case bearing a symbolics badge. However, this is a drop-in replacement module, and yes, that means it's new old stock which is excellent for several reasons that we'll get to later, but the first one is in the way it looks. As you can see from this picture, which is actually the one on Wikipedia, the blue on the blue keys has kind of faded and the grey keys have gone brown, which means that that one has been rather badly sun damaged, unfortunately. This one, being no old stock, still has the colours very nicely preserved, and that's a big plus because, personally, I think its grey and blue colour scheme looks really nice. Anyone who thinks people in the 80s led dull, brown or beige lives, think again. I know there are a lot of modern custom keycap sets with all kinds of colour schemes, but I don't really like most of those. These, though, I mean, <laughs> wow. <laughs> And yes, I know there are Space Cadet inspired custom keycap sets, which is pretty cool actually. Anyway, this keyboard has a lot of history obviously, so let me give you some background info. In 1958, Lisp, a programming language centered around lists, recursive functions and symbolic expressions, was devised by John McCarthy during his fellowship at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was one of the first programming languages, and it was intimately linked to artificial intelligence research. In 1973, Tom Knight and Richard Greenblatt from the AI lab at MIT started a project called the MIT Lisp Machine Project to develop computers based around the Lisp programming architecture. At first, this was a very small-scale operation, mostly centered around MIT itself, and the first two versions, CONS and CADA, quickly became standard tools for hackers. Six years later, in 1979, Greenblatt was approached with the idea to commercialize the technology and expand it to a wider audience. This joint venture became a company called Symbolix, presumably named after Lisp's reliance on symbolic expressions, and their first product, the LM2, which was essentially a rebadged CADA machine, became what was at the time the first commercially available workstation as we now know it. It was this machine, the LM2, that came with the Space Cadet keyboard. The Space Cadet was designed by Tom Knight, one of the people at the MIT AI lab, and it was an expanded version of his earlier Knight keyboard used on one of their display systems. Because the Space Cadet shipped mostly only with the LM2, of which there were only about 100 units produced, each one of which sold at what is now equivalent to about 200 grand, the Space Cadet keyboard is exceptionally rare and hard to get hold of. It was succeeded by the much more simplified and more plain looking Symbolix keyboard, which came with a 3600 series of machines that replaced the LM2. This keyboard is internally much the same as the Space Cadet, but it's smaller, doesn't have as many buttons, and it has a white and grey colour scheme rather than the more lively grey and blue palette of the Space Cadet. In many ways though, the review also covers most aspects of the Symbolix keyboard. The fact that I can get away with just mentioning this keyboard in passing, even though it's also very famous, very rare and very expensive, is a good indication of what level the Space Cadet is on, by the way. <laughs> the Symbolics keyboard itself was later replaced by a keyboard that had three different revisions, all of which were made by NMB using Space Invader switches and, somewhat uniquely for NMB, using double shot keycaps, which I didn't even know existed before I borrowed this one. The Space Cadet keyboard was specifically developed to be able to type as many characters as possible and this is why it included as many as seven modifier keys. Top, Greek or Front, Shift, Control, Meta, Super and Hyper, the latter two of which it introduced. Compare that to the more common three modifier keys, Control, Alt and Shift, and nowadays the occasional use of a Windows key and you can see that the Space Cadet is really quite a specialty keyboard. 
So the shift key obviously accessed capital letters and such, while the top key accessed the characters shown at the top of the keycaps, and front the characters at the front of the keycaps, which were mostly Greek letters, which is why the front cap was also labeled Greek. So for example, if I typed shift A, I would get an uppercase A. If I typed top A, I would get an upside down T. And Greek A, I would get a lowercase alpha. And shift Greek A, I would get an uppercase alpha, but that's just a capital letter A. The character set was further expanded using the control, meta, super, and hyper keys, which could be used in various combinations to yield even more characters. For example, you could press control, meta, super, hyper, C to get, I don't know, maybe an emoji in the shape of a bottle of Coke or whatever. It could have typed a giant black cock for all I know. All in all, you could type over 8,000 characters on this keyboard using various combinations of keys and modifiers, including the entire APL character set, which is actually natively shown on the keycaps. I mean, I didn't even know there were 8,000 characters. Now, I have no idea why this thing was called the Space Cadet keyboard, but considering the insane complexity of this thing, it makes me think that if you used to use one of these, you must be a bit of a fruitcake. And that's coming from someone with a PhD in chemistry, so if they're even fruitier than me, that's really saying something. The modifiers were specifically placed close to each other and in a line so that you could easily press multiple at the same time. And this is apparently one of the design decisions that influenced the design of Emacs, which also makes frequent use of multiple modifier keys. That said, some users at the time did remark it would be more suited to an operator with three or four hands. In fact, even the makers must have thought in retrospect that all this might have been slightly over the top because the Symbolics keyboard that soon replaced it could only type about 2,000 characters and it was much smaller and simpler in design. And by extension, not quite as cool, of course. Other funky keys present on the keyboard include Roman numerals 1 through 4 for switching between lists, what appears to be arrow keys in the shape of little hands, which is pretty cute, all kinds of weird terminal commands, and even a rub out key, which I assume didn't mean back then what it does now. <laughs> I'll admit all this funky stuff does give the Space Cadet keyboard a very unique character though. <laughs> I just love crazy shit like this. <laughs> If we have a look at the chassis itself, we can find a date sticker from 1982, which makes sense, and a sticker showing that it was made in Freeport, Illinois in the USA by Microswitch, a division of Honeywell. And yes, that points directly towards the switches, which are Honeywell's rather famous SD series of linear hall effect switches. They came in various weightings and types, including on this board, but most of the switches are type 4B3E, which is weighted at 2.5 Oz, which I looked up and it's equivalent to 74 milliliters of force, somehow. These switches are based on magnets and they make use of the whole effect to bend electrons off a path through a semiconductor to create a voltage transverse to the main current which is non-linearly dependent on the proximity of the magnet. I've discussed in great detail how this works in my ITT Courier video, so if you want a more in-depth explanation of how this works, click the link in the description below to take you directly to it. In short, it's based on a transverse voltage stemming from electromagnetic diversion of electrons through a semiconductor, but if you want to know how it works in detail, watch the video. The result of this design is a contactless switch that has the potential to be excessively reliable as well as smooth. The first is because magnets are obviously pretty damn hard to wear out, so these switches are rated at 30 billion key presses per key, which is <laughs> completely insane. And the smoothness comes from the lack of contact necessary between the slider and the contact mechanism, which in fact is completely separate, you can just pull it out. And less contact means less friction, which means a smoother switch. Now one thing I've noticed with these Honeywell Hall effect boards is that although they can potentially be very smooth, they actually really don't like dirt much at all, which is ironic for a contactless switch, but still. Really, you need to get these in pretty clean condition to get the most out of them. And thankfully, that's why this one being new old stock is such a perfect occasion to judge the key feel at their best. And most definitely, it's quite interesting at that. Now it's not actually 100% clean, in fact a few of the keys have a little bit of grit around them, and this is instantly noticeable in the key feel. 
which is grittier and which binds a little bit compared to other keys on the keyboard. The rest of the keys are in excellent condition though and they feel very smooth. The travel is a bit deep, slightly over 4mm and it's somewhat monotonous in a way but it's definitely pretty nice and smooth. That said, I would say that the switches are actually not the board's strongest point. The weighting is pretty stiff at around 70 grams of actuation force and a bottom out weight of around 100 grams which was the same weighting as the ones in my ITT courier keyboard which were also too stiff for me. They did do versions of these with lighter weightings, such as this one, and the smoothness actually takes the edge off of the worst of the stiffness in this keyboard, but it's still more than I would have liked. I'll be honest, although these switches are really good and definitely unmatched in terms of reliability, there are linear switches I prefer over these, especially Green Alps and Fujitsu Leaf Springs, which are both very smooth as well and perfectly weighted to boot. I think their legendary reputation is a little bit exaggerated, but at the same time, this isn't quite the end of the Honeywell Hall effect story yet. There will be more on that topic at a later point in time in the new year. The switches are rather large and densely made and the keycaps are humongous, so obviously you'd expect a pretty full typing sound, wouldn't you? So let's see. <laughs> yeah, I think that fits the bill pretty well, wouldn't you say? Not bad for a keyboard that doesn't even have a case around it. And speaking of the keycaps, they're Honeywell's famous giant blocks of double shot ABS. They're the second thickest caps I know of behind Fujitsu's, but personally I think they're actually slightly better made because they're less prone to breakage. In fact, Honeywell's keycaps are arguably the best caps ever made, ever. The single unit ones weigh up to 2.67 grams each, which is over two and a half times the weight of an equivalent Cherry MX lasered PBT keycap. In fact, they weigh more a piece than an MX cap and a switch put together. And considering the switches are over four grams themselves as well, a keyboard with 100 of these would have almost 700 grams just in keycaps and switches on it. That's almost one and a half times the weight of a whole Apple aluminium keyboard. Jesus Christ on a meat popsicle. The larger keycaps are mounted with the dummy switch bizarrely wearing a little Christmas bonnet on its head, and the ones too small to stabilize are asymmetrically mounted, which can lead to binding on off-center key presses, although it's not too bad on this one thanks to the condition it's in. On Honeywell keyboards that weren't as clean, I found the binding to be pretty bad though. And of course, the caps have that lovely grey and blue colour scheme that's stylish but not too in your face and classic without being overbearing. And they have cool secondary and tertiary legends. Nice. Now, I'll be brutally honest, the only real reason to get one of these is as a showpiece or a collector's item. But what a collector's item this is. It's cool enough to just see it in a picture, but especially in the flesh, it just has a lot of presence, not to mention a cool backstory. On a slightly different note, 2017 has been by far the biggest year for this channel, and I thought it only fitting to review the Holy of Holies as the last video. Next week, there will be no video due to the holidays. Originally, at the beginning of the year, I was going to end it on this video and then stop doing videos altogether. Hell, I wasn't even going to do this year at all, but the response has been so positive that I've decided to keep going on, at least for the moment. I've got so much more cool stuff to show you guys, let alone all the videos that I want to revisit properly, that I think it'd be a criminal waste to stop now. So the show will continue for the while until I finally get tired of it, you guys get tired of it, or until I run out of things to show you. That's it. Thank you all so much for everything, your enthusiasm, the many donations and services many of you have provided, and of course, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it all, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on the holy grail of keyboards, the Symbolics Space Cadet.